This week's interview is one that has done incredibly well. It's one of the most popular interviews we've ever done. And it is actually kind of surprising because it's with William Labov, a professor of linguistics. And the interview is back from January of 2013, about two and a half years ago. And we talked about the different dialects in the US and how American dialects and accents are kind of changing. And I have received so many emails from linguistics professors and English professors in high schools and colleges who show this interview to students because William Labov is such a, a well known scholar of, of English and of language that it has become one of our most popular interviews. And it is not a topic I would have expected to do so well. So we will go back to that. William Labov, alive and well at 87 years old. He was 84 or 85 when he joined us back in 2013. Let's get right into that interview. Joining me is William Labov. He's a professor of linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania, also author of this book, Dialect Diversity in America, The Politics of Language Change. So, Professor Labov, thanks so much for being here. This is a fascinating topic to me. I think a good way to start would be how many distinct dialects do you identify in the United States? Well, on the map of our uh, Atlas of North American English, there's about 15. Uh, they differ as far as their size and importance are concerned. People used to think of the American dialects as North, South, and General American. But uh, there isn't any such thing as General American. Uh, there is, however, a distinction between the North, the Midland, in between in the South. So when people when people use this term, which I don't even know if it's a term you agree with, but kind of a generic American accent, what are, what are they really referring to in your experience? Well, there are some dialects where change is not so active. Uh, and I think that people point to the Midwest around Iowa as dialect that is missing some of the marked features of the Northeast, the South, or the North. Understood. So when when we talk about different dialects taking on negative connotations sometimes, right, Do, do uh, we, we see situations where there's sometimes stereotypes around certain dialects. One of them, I think, that's a common one is that certain Southern dialects reflect either lack of intelligence or lack of education. I'm curious, what's your opinion of how those connotations develop around certain American dialects? There's two dialects that are marked as in this negative way that you talk about. And the first is the one I, it was not the South, but New York City. <laughs> uh, my first study was the, called The Social Stratification of English in New York City. And I faced the fact that New York is what we called a, a sink of negative prestige. Uh, and uh, or another way to put it was that if you, you're dead on Madison Avenue if you sound like New York. Well, that tendency... It goes way back. Uh, it was once noted by the great dialectologist Raven McDavid that the line surrounding New York City is the same as the line of the occupation of the city by the British troops in the War of 1812. Hmm. Whereas most uh, big cities have an area of 100 miles radius around them showing their influence, uh, like Philadelphia, Boston, Charleston, New York City is tightly confined, and uh, the reasons for this particular stereotype and negative pattern are hard to put your hand on because New York is the leader in fashion, in finance, uh, in so many other areas, even in graffiti. New York is the big cultural influence of the city, but as far as language is concerned, it is stamped as being uncouth or a lower class. Sure. Okay, and then and then also I would love to get your thoughts on on this kind of prototypical Southern accent. And the reason I'm interested in that is we've had a number of interviews on this program with different people. And what we find is often we'll interview someone who ha grew up in the South, went to school in the South, lived in the South in their entire life, but they have no particularly noticeable accent that appears to be from there. And I guess what really my question is, is do we, do you experience, do you have any, any evidence to suggest that 
There are people that may either deliberately or by osmosis, maybe from being involved in higher education, lose what may be a kind of particularly regionalized dialect. What is the process by which that happens in your experience? Well, the influence of higher education on local phonology is the name of a research project that we're engaged in right now. Uh, and it used to be that going to college was, I used to think, was bad for you. As a linguist, I like people, people to use their native personal accent they grew up with. We have to face the fact that certain dialects have negative prestige. I mentioned New York, and it's true what we said, what you suggested about the South. In our atlas, we find that almost all of the dialects of the United States are becoming more different from each other, are growing and developing, and their idiosyncratic features becoming stronger. The South is different. The South is receding slowly, but gradually. The boundaries of the South are shrinking. But more importantly, big cities like Atlanta, Dallas, and Houston are filled with people coming from the North, and they've lost a great deal of their Southern character. Hmm. So is it fair to say that, that you believe that as we go forward, what is sometimes called the prototypical Southern accent may become something that is spoken, that is heard less and less? Well, that would be going a little far, but uh, <laughs> just to put it this way, we had the last four or five presidents have shown the Southern accent in their features and didn't do them any harm. Uh, Bill Clinton is not injured by his Arkansas accent. So that uh, politicians make a find a middle way to show their local affiliation and at the same time to indicate that they're intelligent and educated people. Dennis Preston is a linguist who studied this folk psychology of language more than anyone else. And he's made, had people draw maps of where the best English is spoken, where the worst English is spoken. Huh. And it's over and over again, the South is marked as where the worst English is spoken. As you said, it's associated with rural, ignorant, uh, sometimes called lazy speech. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we look back to uh, look at the North, we'll find that people say the best English is spoken well, in Michigan. They say the best English is spoken in Michigan. Uh, I've been trying to uh, find the origins of this development <laughs> and we go back and look at the settlement patterns of the United States and see where the Yankees settled the North and the Quakers settled the Midland area along with the Appalachian people and the South has its origins but the these dialect differences have their roots in the violent controversies of the middle of the 19th century Hmm. having to do with slavery. Interesting. And, and uh, I think it would be difficult to avoid the implication that people associate Southern accent with negative attitudes towards race, even though a vast number of Southerners have taken the lead in civil rights. No question about it. Let's shift a little bit and talk about changes that we can observe right now in American dialects. Now, one of them is the northern cities shift. Can you describe what that is and maybe give us some examples? Well, I've got a, a map from the Atlas that, uh, to look at here. And we can see this area called the north outlined in blue. And within that, there's an area called the inland north, which is surrounding the Great Lakes. Uh, it includes cities like Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, Detroit, uh, Cleveland, Toledo, Gary, uh, Chicago, Madison, uh, Will, Milwaukee. That's a vast area of about 30 million people, and they all are marked by a new sound change that developed in the middle of the 20th century, which is quite remarkable. No one talks about it. No one makes fun of it. There's no stereotypes to do with it, but... If you hear, listen to people on the radio, you'll hear people saying things like, not what happened, but what happened. Not, look at that, but look at that. Huh. So all these words spelled with the short A, uh, that, rap, mat, athletic, are pronounced mat, that, rap, athletic. 
you'll hear this from very educated people, from judges, from lawyers. Uh, it isn't as if it's a uh, stigmatized feature at all. On the contrary, but it's a growing tendency which has reached its peak in this area. And then it brought about changes in other vowels, the neighboring vowels of the system, so that the ver words that are spelled with short O moved forward to the place where the short A used to be. So people in this area will say, not I've got the job, but I've got the job. And not a pair of socks, but a pair of sacks. Huh. This leads to a lot of misunderstanding across dialects, of course. I'll say. So then there's three other sounds. Perhaps one of the most striking ones is the one that is spelled, words are spelled with short U. And, uh, or sometimes O as in bosses. Uh, so one of the experiments we have, people are listening to uh, individual words and they hear the word bosses. And then a little later on they hear the bosses with the antennas on top. And then we used to ride on the bosses with the antennas on the top and gradually people begin to realize that this person is pronouncing the word bus the way they pronounce boss. Right. Uh, so these rotations, this great rotation of five vowels, it is, is what we call the northern city shift, and it is something that's growing and developing and becoming, perhaps someday it'll become conscious and people will talk about it. But right now, it's marking that most educated, Yankee-settled area of the American linguistic scene as quite different from any other. The other one that you talk about is the vowel merger. And so an example of that would be, for example, the word cot, C-O-T, being pronounced the same way as to catch something, C-A-U-G-H-T. So talk about that one a little bit. Well, I've got a map there for you to take a look at uh, from the Atlas showing the vast areas of the United States where cot and caught are pronounced the same, hmm. the area marked in green. And it includes uh, eastern New England, where this started, and it includes western Pennsylvania, and all of Canada, and most of the West. So geographically, it's about half of the United States, even though in the population it's a little less. And in those areas, people say, uh, I'm sleeping on a cot, and I've caught a cold. They talk about a boy named Don and a girl named Don will sound the same, which is a source of great confusion for people who are named Don and Dawn. Right, so can do that one again. Do, do the different pronunciation for Don and Don, because I, I think I say it the same way. Give us the different one. I'll give you two ways of exaggerating the difference. Okay. In New York, it's Don and Dawn. <laughs> Don and Dawn. In Chicago, it's Dan and Don, but they're different. It'll be very hard for some of my listeners who, who are of the merger to hear the difference because once two vowels have been decided they're the same, it's very hard to hear them as different. Right. Okay, this, this is fascinating. Let me ask you another question. Is it possible that we may at some point get to, I, I want to get to the political influence on dialect, do you believe there's a situation that could arise in this country where there becomes either a distinction on dialect among blue and red states, in other words, more liberal and more conservative areas, uh, or simply among liberals and conservatives? Could there be any influence on society such that would create dialect splits among political lines? We've been looking at that rather closely the evidence is difficult to put together because it has to do with correlations. The blue states and the red states are very tightly correlated with this difference we've been talking about. Uh, the area where the northern city shift takes place is very much a part of the blue states. And its origins, as we've been able to trace it, go back to the period that Yankee settlement area was motivated and was riddled by violent storms of political controversy where people denounced the South and said that slavery was a sin and that any church which was associated with the Southern church was guilty of sins. So that uh, this dialect difference 
grew up in a period where the split between the North and the South politically and ideologically became extreme. And uh, Henry Ward Beecher said at one point, the South has been found wanting. This country will be governed by Northern ideas, Northern, Northern achievements, and Northern ways of thinking. So the split between the North and the South has, has go, takes its origin in that period before the Civil War. Uh, is it continuing? Well, what has happened is that the geographic distribution of these groups have been reversed. When I was a kid, the Rock Ridge Republicans were solidly entrenched in New England, and the South was solidly Democratic. And as we all know, that has been reversed now. And, uh, but the dialect differences that mark these two uh, regions still persist in, in a way that continues the early division between the North and the South found in 1840, 1850. The last thing I want to touch on, and this is kind of an interesting thing where I would just love to get your expert opinion. My producer, Lewis, we've observed that he he has kind of his own dialect, which we've noticed that he speaks. And there's certain words that he pronounces in an unusual way, which I'll recreate for you just to get your thought on where may this come from. Now, a little background on Lewis. Lewis was born and grew up in western Massachusetts, so outside of the of the kind of traditional Boston accent area. And his father learned English as a second language. His father's an immigrant uh, from Iran, okay? Now, we've noticed a couple things Lewis does. A lot of words that here, for example, I would pronounce, I go to high school, or I just purchased an item. Lewis pronounces, I, I go to high school, and I purchased an item, okay? Now, another weird pronunciation for Lewis is the, the word I would say museum. Lewis tends to say museum. This is this is very specific to certain words. We have no idea where this came from, and Lewis doesn't either. Give us an, an idea, a hypothesis on this. Well, the first group of words that you talked about has been a great focus of attention for us in Philadelphia. It's called Canadian raising, where people he said people say, not ice cream, but ice cream. Now, give me again the pronunciation that you hear from your friend Lewis. So, whereas I would say ice cream, Lewis would say ice cream. Well, the I, distong, is the big marker of north-south differences. So, and there are two ways that the north can differentiate from the south. One is to say ice cream. The other is to say ice cream. Right. Strong distong. Uh, is this unusual for Lewis, who grew up in Massachusetts, to just have these certain words that he pronounces this way? Well, the certain words you're talking about, I assume, are not just an individual word, but a member of a group. Right. So people who say bike and right and sight also say pipe and life, uh, taking the whole group of words that end in what we call voiceless consonants. So the, the example you gave of ice cream, and two examples are those that come before S, F, P, T, K, which are consonants that we call voiceless. Uh, I don't hear in your reproduction of Lewis's uh, speech any of the major tendencies that are marked in New England. Uh, I don't either, yeah. No, it uh, seems to be different. But in general, we could say that people are not marked by the pronunciation of their parents used to think that ethnicity, where your parents came from, would be the strongest influence on your local dialect. But it turns out that children somehow have the ability to turn away from the peculiar ways their parents speak if their parents are not native speakers of English. Hmm. Uh, so the, the slightest influence on the development of a dialect is the way your parents spoke. Uh, this is uh, surprising and indicates that children somehow have an uncanny ability to know what is the most useful form of language that they can use in communicating with their, not just their friends and their peers, but the whole world out there. 
Well, we may have a question mark here with Lewis. I would think that, you know, I would love to make him available to you for an in-depth study on just exactly what went on with with how Lewis speaks. But that may be a broader project than just one person can take on. We may need a team to analyze that, Professor. Um, This has been fantastic, though. We've been speaking with Professor William Labov, professor of linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania. I recommend the book dialect diversity in america the politics of language change professor thank you so much for doing this it's a pleasure